All right. Well, good evening to the marathon. Glad to see you here, and you're wondering why I said marathon, because he said we were here for the preaching, so what that means is, is that I don't have to be done until the news tonight. <laughs> so Brother Tom McDonald's here, he's a friend of mine, and I'm glad to see him here, but he could say amen to that. He probably wouldn't, but he could probably say amen to that and tell you that that might be true. I think that one of the most important things in the last days is to get back to basics. I think one of the things that's occurred in our churches today is is that we've gotten caught up in everything except what church was originally or initially for uh, church has now flipped around and sort of changed its way or its direction and it's become more about uh oh shall we say current events than it is bible events it's become more about anxiety and fear and it's become more about governmental issues and political issues it's become more about viruses and atomic bombs and monkey poxes and chicken poxes and all kind of other popses and poxes and and then when you come to church there's no preaching from the bible it's preaching from the headlines ripped from the headlines it just changed this week and all of a sudden you almost get this idea that the headlines have precedent over scripture well in the south we say amen to that even if we know we're lying <laughs> Some of you think that uh, fair and balanced is more fair and balanced than what the Bible says. And the reason that some of you have the anxiety that you have is, is that you're looking at an ever-changing headline on a daily basis as to how much gas prices are going to be and how much is this is going to happen and what's going to happen and when's martial law going to come and when's Kim Jong-un going to throw a nuke at us and now it's going to be Putin and now it's going to be China and now we're going to go into the Strait of Hormuz and then we're going to defend the Taiwan and Bordian. That stuff changes every single day. There's no consistency in that. There's nothing that you can sink your teeth into. I can tell you one thing for sure. Everybody in here, if the rapture doesn't happen, you're going to die. And the issue is going to be when you die is not who you voted for. And the issue is not going to be who you liked and who you didn't like. The issue is going to be, are you saved? If you're not saved, you know where you go? You go to hell. They said they're going to know there's a God when they're beneath the sod. That's a true statement. You'll know whether you go to heaven or hell, there's a God. And so the most important thing that we have to do when it comes to revival, in spite of what the pastor said, and I agree, it needs to be about God first, but what about your relationship with God? When's the last time that you settled down and you did a little bit of your own uh, visiting yourself and you kind of did a little bit of uh, reconnaissance on your own deal and you kind of did a little research to see where am I with the Lord today? Am I better this week than I was a week ago? Am I better this year than I was last year? I mean, a lot of people, you know, they got upset. I understand all about the virus. I'm not here to preach about the virus. Mask, don't mask, do this, don't do that. That's just a great opportunity for the real you to come out. Self-preserving rascals is what comes out of us when it comes to that. Uh, skin for skin, Job says, all that a man hath, he'll give for his life. And we find out how spiritual we really are because we're more about preserving our life and our reputation than we are about where we're headed when we die. This is how to be for three days, so you just can relax now. If you leave, now we'll talk about you. But the thing you ought to recognize, ladies and gentlemen, is, is you all have human nature. I have human nature, and we tend, if we're not careful, to drift away from the thing that's important to us. In Revelation chapter number 2, you have a church there. Don't turn there. We're going to go somewhere else in a minute. But in Revelation chapter number 2, you have a church there by the name of Ephesus. Ephesus is known for doing everything that a church could possibly do. I mean, including trying and finding out people that are false apostles and false doctrine and teaching false doctrine. I mean, they're meeting themselves coming and going. They got every kind of program there is. They got juvenile ministries and prison ministries and, and they got hospital ministries and they're meeting in church and they're having revival meetings and all that. That. But the Lord said, I have something against you. And a lot of people read past it really fast. And you say, well, you know, that's just a historical event or it's some esoterical event that's going to happen in the future and it's just a spiritual thing. No, it's a real thing. It's a real church that existed then and it'll exist in the tribulation. You know what the Lord had against them? You say, well, they're doctrinally straight. They're just as straight as a gun barrel. Yeah, and just as empty. They got everything just as straight as they could possibly have it. Doctrine of their straight. They got a visitation program. The whole nine yards. If you were to put it on paper, you'd say there's a business model right there for a successful church. There it is, right there. There it is, looking at it. Man, it can't be no better than that. Except the Lord said something's missing. The same thing that's missing in Ephesus is missing in most of our lives today. You say, what is it? I have somewhat against thee. What is that? You left your first love. 
You wouldn't have any of this, wouldn't have any desire, wouldn't even want to be in church and anything whatsoever if at some point in time in your life, for me it was seven years of age, I ran headlong into Jesus Christ and I had Him to save me because I didn't want to go to hell. You said, well, you didn't know anything about the Lord. No, I knew I didn't want to go to hell. A fellow came up to me in a meeting one time and I preached. I gave my testimony, a brief testimony, getting saved at seven. And he came up after I preached for a few minutes there and I got done and he came up. The only thing he got out of the sermon was, there ain't no way he's from the south. There ain't no way you got saved at seven. I said, well, that's when I got saved. He says, you wouldn't have known enough about the Lord to get saved at seven. I said, I didn't know a whole lot about the Lord except he could save me from burning and I didn't want to burn. That ain't a reason to get saved. I said, well, tell me a better reason to get saved. <laughs> I said, listen, man, I don't know what to tell you. If you want to doubt my salvation for me, help yourself. I know I'm saved. I, you say, you can't know that. Yes, I can. But I don't look at my personal life to tell you whether I'm saved. I believe what the Bible says. If I put my faith and trust in the blood Jesus, uh, shed blood of Jesus Christ, I trusted Him as my personal Savior, I'm going to heaven when I die. Now, my fellowship might be different. In other words, my standing is in great shape. I'm seated with Him right now in heavenly places. I know I don't look like a saint, but I'm a saint right now. <laughs> Pretty scary, isn't it? <laughs> well, he'll change my vile body into a body like his when I get raptured, but I'm seated with him. But my state, that'll change. I got on a plane early this morning in Jacksonville, Florida, and I'm in that airplane, and I leave Duval County, and we fly up to Georgia, and you've got to go to Georgia every time. I think if I die, they'll run me through Atlanta on the way to the heaven. <laughs> The craziest thing I've ever seen in my life. You got a detour to Atlanta. Why don't you just make a straight shot to Chicago? It's hard enough to get out of Chicago once you get in there with all that traffic and stuff. But you know what happened? We flew across about four or five states to get here. My position in the airplane didn't change, but I changed different states. You know what will happen in your life as a Christian sometimes? Your position in Christ doesn't change. You're saved. We call that eternal security. Jimmy Swagger used to call that the damnable uh, uh, doctrine of eternal security. He called it a damnable Baptist doctrine. It's not a Baptist doctrine. It's a Bible doctrine. I'm saved and sealed under the day of redemption. All the verses he quotes don't have anything to do with you, and they don't have enough lead in them to make a good pencil. They don't make any sense whatsoever to what he did. Anyway, but the bottom line is this. Sometimes you know what's going to happen? You're going to get out of fellowship with the Lord. Sometimes you know what you're going to do? You can get so busy with what you have going on that your state changes like somebody pulls out in front of you when you're driving. I bet sometimes there's some very wonderful worm words of Jesus that come out of your mouth. <laughs> Maybe. Sometimes the things aren't going right at the house. Sometimes financial pressure. Sometimes fear and anxiety creeps in. Sometimes we get our eyes off the Lord, don't we? You say, what does that change? It doesn't change his relationship to me. He saved me. But it changes my relationship to him. You know what he said about the church at Ephesus? He said about the church at Ephesus, he said, I got something against you. Yeah, what's that, Lord? I mean, we've done everything. He said, I see all the work you've done. I see everything that you've done. I, I paid attention to it. But none of it matters to me much at all. Well, why not, Lord? Look at all the good we're doing. <laughs> because you left me along the way. Sometimes you get so busy, you know what happens? You leave the Lord. If you take your Bible, don't take it now. Just let me set this up for a little bit, and I'm trying to come down too. I had to ride with him while he was trying to come back, so you think he has to come down. <laughs> Poor Kirsten's in the back seat back there, you know, and she's got a grip on the leather there. But, it, but at any rate, uh, in, in Hebrews chapter number 11, you don't go but four verses, and you run into an interesting uh, setup of the way things are in that passage. Your King James Bible lays it out in such a fashion that it shows you what's important. Step number one, he says, Abel offered a more excellent sacrifice. All right, if that's the beginning of things, Abel starts all the way back at the garden over there with Adam and Eve and then Cain and Abel. Abel, what does he do? He offers a sacrifice. That'd be your worship. You know the second thing that it brings up? In that second thing there in verse number seven, I believe, of that passage, you know what it says? Enoch walked with God and he was not. So much like God, he, he ceased to exist. That's a great thing. Well, that's my walk. You know what the next thing is? Noah's building an ark. You say, that's the work. You know what we learned for years and years and years, or what we thought? We thought if we got busy building an ark like Noah, we must be walking with God, and we must be having fellowship with God. We must be worshiping Him. That's not true. Work doesn't produce walk, and it doesn't produce worship. 
You know what we have to do? Every professional athlete I've known, I don't look like one, I'm sure of that, I understand those things, but every professional athlete I've known and a multitude of uh, different sports, every time they get ready to start back at the beginning of a season, they do two things that I think are outstanding and they're unique to professional athletes. I've asked them, I've talked to them. I said, what do you do? He said, well, first of all, when we go back, we brush up on the things that we've done all of our life since we were playing Pop Warner ball or T-ball or we started off in the junior leagues or whatever. We go back to the basics and the fundamentals. Now, see, we think that's regressive. No, it's not. It's making sure you don't forget the things that got you where you got. I mean, wouldn't it be nice if when you got saved, remember how you got saved, you witnessed to a fence post? Remember when you got saved, you just couldn't wait to tell people about it? Remember how you were excited about it? Remember how you'd come to church and instead of criticizing everybody, you thought they were all saints sitting here? You didn't know they'd be arguing over the tater salad in the background. You didn't know they'd be fighting over the color of the paint on the walls and who's going to park in whatever parking place. I was even careful when I came to sit down here. I said, is that somebody's seat? And they said, well, it don't matter. Just sit down there. And I said, oh, I'm from the South. You sit in somebody's seat in the South? <laughs> They'll, t they'll kill you, man. It's like that. That's my seat. You know, it's like, okay, well, I'm sorry. I'll just leave. You can leave, but you ain't going to sit in my seat or park in my parking space. Amen. Amy can help me. She's from in Jacksonville. She flew up here to come to the meeting. Now, now listen to me. You know what happens? We get to thinking because we're busy that we must be close to God. Sometimes you can be so busy you forgot God you left him in the trunk of the car. Sometimes you get so busy doing all the other things that are going on in life. Guess what happened? You had not walked with God in a long time. I like that old song. I like the old hymns. I'm old school. I'm old timer. I don't like all the modern newfangled stuff. I don't like the contemporary jazz stuff. I guess you could say I'm an old people now. And I don't like all that stuff in church. It don't feel churchy to me. It feels like a nightclub. I was a policeman for years. I had to go into all those nightclubs and bring all those hoodlums out and do all that other kind of stuff that people don't appreciate whatsoever, you know. But I had to get all the stuff that, that goes with doing that kind of a job. And I go into a church and I hear the same kind of music. It don't hit me right. It, it just, it don't feel like church to me. It feels like I'm back in a club, dim the lights, and somebody's trying to pick somebody up and drinking liquor or whatever else it might be. I like the old stuff. I like that song, I Come to the Garden Alone while the dew is still on the roses, and he walks with me, and he talks with me. I like that kind of stuff. I think that's good. But you know what happens? We've gotten busy nowadays, and we got so busy that we forgot to say, you know what, I think I'm walking with the Lord and talking with him. Well, let me ask you this. When was the last time you had just a good old revival meeting with the Lord and went down to an altar and sat down there for a little while and shut up long enough to hear what God has to say to you? You ever consider for just a minute how many times you come to the Lord and you get ready to pray? I like to pray, but I catch myself praying all the time. Now, Lord, I need this, and Lord, I need that, and Lord, give me this, and Lord, give me that, and Lord, if you do this, and Lord, if you do that, and Lord, I think you ought to do this, and I think you ought to do that, and Lord, the way I see it is da, da, da. And the next thing you know, it sounds like I'm speaking in some kind of foreign tongue or something. And the Lord says, we don't believe in tongues. That's for the Jews. Why are you speaking in one, you know? And I said, well, the Holy Ghost is to be my interpreter, and he can just tell him this and that and the other. Have you ever just come to the Lord and just started right off the bat and say, Lord, I sure do appreciate I can see today. Lord, sure do appreciate I can hear today. Lord, sure was great to get up this morning and taste a good cup of coffee and have a cinnamon roll. Lord, I sure do appreciate being able to walk today and being able to have something to do today. Uh, Lord, you sure have been good to me. Appreciate I can take a full breath, man. I, I'm glad my lungs are clear. I'm glad I'm not in the hospital, Lord. Have you ever spent any time instead of just gimme, 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 just saying, Lord, uh, thank you, thank you, thank you, thank you. I bet you get a lot of prayers answered that way. I bet if you started just thanking the Lord for the things that you know to thank Him for, I bet you this, I bet the Lord would call Michael or Gabriel over there and say, man, give that kid something, man. He can't shut up. He just keeps thanking me for everything. Give him something else. You ever have a kid that's kind of selfish and every time they come to you, something's busted, something's broke, they're griping about something and they want more, they want more, they want more. And then you got another kid that's just the opposite. They come to you and they thank you for a bowl of ice cream and then you want to just give them a whole half a gallon, you know, just because they're, you think about that. Hey, when was the last time you came to church and instead of it being about the people that were in here, it was about you and the Lord? Remember when you got saved, I was telling you earlier, remember somebody get up and preach and they couldn't preach their way out of a paper bag, but you just thought it was so great that they were trying to do something for Jesus? <laughs> Remember they get up and it'd sound like two styrofoam lids running together, man, and just squeaking up there and squealing like fingernails on a chalkboard, man. But there, there was something about their countenance. You know, you just got so you were so glad to see them doing something for the Lord. You just, you just couldn't stand it. And now you come to church and, yeah, look at her. I don't know where she got that at. I don't, I don't particularly like it on her. I got one like it at the house. Now I can't wear it because they think I'm trying to match her. She wore it before I wore it. <laughs> you ever think about what you come to church for anymore? 
you ever pause to think, you know something, Lord, maybe I need to do some uh, reconnaissance. I need to do a review. I need to do some research. I need to, to see where my relationship is. You say, why does that matter? I don't know when the rapture is going to happen. I don't know when martial law is going to happen. I don't know whether or not there's going to get hit by an atomic bomb. Which, I mean, honestly, to be honest with you, I'd rather go in a pink mist than to go in a hospital bed, to be honest with you. I mean, you know, if it happened, you wouldn't know it was coming anyway. <laughs> what are you going to do about it if it is? Duck, tuck, duck and roll. I mean, what, what are you going to do? Step outside and go, me first, man. I mean, I don't, I don't know. Now, that's just me. I'm fatalistic about that kind of stuff. There's too much concern about self-preservation. I'm living for another kingdom. I'm living for getting out of here, not trying to preserve this. I'm getting old enough now that stuff ain't working that used to work. Uh, now I'm realizing, you know, if it ain't hurting, then it ain't working. So, you know, now it hurts or works. It's like, well, I... Do I really need that to work? I think I'll do without the hurt, right, kind of a thing. I'm getting old enough now that I don't really want to stay around much longer. Now, don't worry, I'm not going to do anything crazy or nothing. Don't misunderstand me. But I'm simply saying to you, what's all the self-preservation stuff? Is that Jesus? That's not a rhetorical question. What's all the self-preservation? That ain't Jesus, that's Peter when the devil's in him. Not so, Lord, thou shalt not surely die. Peter, I came to die. What happened to you being willing to lay your life down for a good cause? Isn't it amazing what man will do for his own self? Isn't it amazing how some of you men, you went to the military, you fought in Vietnam, some of you are old enough to fight in Vietnam, some of you fought in Korea, some of you fought in Afghanistan, some of you fought in Iraq, you were willing to go and be away from your family for six months or nine months or even a year to do your tour of duty over there and be willing to be a bullet stop or be willing to suck some gas into your nostrils and ruin the rest of your life or to die from exposure to Agent Orange or whatever it is and tear your liver out of the frame. It's funny how you're willing to do that and be away from your family, but when it comes to doing that for Jesus, it's kind of, well, I don't, I don't know. Sunday night, i got to be at church on Sunday night. I don't, I don't know, man. I mean, you know, after all, the Cubs are playing or whoever's up here. White Sox, I don't know, what, whatever your favorite team is. But it's interesting we'd be willing to go fight for a country, but we wouldn't be willing to fight for Jesus. Interesting, isn't it, how we're willing to sacrifice for what we really love? We'll work for 30 and 40 years for a company to get a gold watch and a retirement plan, a 401k, or wind up getting Social Security, or whatever it is you got investments in. I don't care what it is, an IRA, I, I'm not a financial guy. Whatever it is you're depending on and leaning on. Funny how you give 40 years of your life for that in order to be able to have that, to live out the rest of your life in fear and agony, and I can't leave the house, and what happens if, and I'm just not so sure. Where's your faith in Jesus? What are you leaving that, living down here for? One day you know what's going to happen? I mean, all of a sudden the Lord's going to descend from heaven with a shout, the voice of an archangel, the trump of God, the dead in Christ shall rise first, the Baptists go first, and then we which are alive and remain shall be caught up together with him, and so shall we ever be with the Lord. Ain't you know what the Lord's going to say? What would you do while you were down there? What would you do while you were down there? Use the church and yourself and your abilities I gave you to promote yourself and to get stuff for you, or did you do something for me? That old preacher used to say all the time, and I'm sure he got it from somebody, and somebody in here probably knows where he got it. But you know what he used to say? Only one life will soon be passed. Only what's done for Christ will last. Well, boy, that's gone. That pioneering spirit's no longer in the church anymore. You older folks that are in here, and I mean no disrespect by that, I'm on your coattails now. The way you started a church and the way you built a church and the things you did when you eked the whole thing out of the ground and you began to get it and get into the community and invite people to come and get them to do that kind of stuff, where's that spirit in the next generation? Where's the desire to get people to come to church? Where's the desire to witness to people? Nowadays, church isn't about witnessing to people. It's not about winning people to Jesus. It's about promoting some kind of an agenda or an idea. Where's God in all of that? We've left our first love. It's been a while since we had a real revival meeting. I believe you can have a revival meeting. You say, how do you do it? Draw a circle around you and stay in that circle until you have a revival and the revival might break out. But you ain't going to have no revival in a nation or in a church until you have one individually. And if you don't want to have it, God ain't going to force it on you. He's going to save you. He's going to rapture you out of here. And some of you old buzzards, you're going to die and be in the box for a while. And then you're going to be absent from your body here and be up there with the Lord. And you're going to look down and go, 
Well, I could have probably done just a little bit more. I should have probably done a little more. That loud mouth came up here from Florida, and I kind of, you know, I just kind of got mad at his delivery. I'd appreciate him raising his voice like that and all that kind of stuff. And the Lord said, you think he's loud? You think the Lord's going to take a shine to that attitude? That's what we say in the South, take a shine. That means, do you, do you think the Lord's going to like it or not? He ain't going to like it at all. He doesn't like a lackadaisical attitude. Not toward doing stuff. That's not what I'm saying. How's your relationship with him? Why, if some of you had the relationship with your husband or your wife or your family that you have with the Lord right now, you'd be in court already and be divorced already. Your family wouldn't even come home for Mother's Day or for the family reunion. You say, why? Because you ain't working at it. You say, why? You don't do anything. It's just God's here and that's, I'm here. I'm sitting on my blessed assurance, you know. Bless me if you can, preacher. You know, just in the south, they, they fold their arms then they cross their legs. They turn their shoulder to you like this and they kind of give you that, you know, mm -hmm, I got you. Bless me if you think you can there, sonny boy. They give you that look. Okay, well, I can't bless you. Nothing I can do. I got nothing in my briefcase. I got nothing. Brother Joe's sitting over there right now going, my Lord, preacher, I mean, you're starting off like guns are blazing. It's your fault the way you drove and the coffee she gave me. Now, I'm going somewhere with all this kind of stuff, and I'm trying to help you to understand something. If there was ever last days, it's last days. You say, oh, so you know when the rapture is. I don't know when the rapture is. It might be 20 more years from now. But you ain't going to be here 20 more years. Some of you older folks ain't going to be here five more years. The way things were a couple of years ago, where I'm at, some of you wouldn't be here a year. I don't care what it is that you think caused it or how it got hatched out or some monkey got with some bat and then some elephant jumped in there and they mixed it all together and it came out of cauldron and then the 5G came along and, and now we have this all. I don't care what happened. People died from it. My best friend died from it. So whatever it was that caused it, you're not guaranteed tomorrow. You don't know that you might not kick off now. And you know what's going to happen? Then you're going to give an account to God because you're saved for what you did for Him. And so that's why you're looking at me right now like a blinking frog in a hailstorm. You're like, good night, man. What in the world? And if He's influencing this place up here, we need to cut that influence off. That's a little bit crazy. Yeah, because you know where it all starts? It starts with your personal relationship with the Lord. How is it? Can you get a prayer through? Somebody calls you in the hospital and they're jammed up and in a mess. Can you get a prayer through? When you can't get in a cotton picking room back there because they're worried about something spreading on you or some other kind of foolishness and they stop you at the door and tell you you can't get in to see your best friend when he's dying. Can you get a prayer through and say, Lord, tell him what's going on. You got to talk to him on the little Zoom thing and that kind of deal while they got him full of paralytics and put him on all the stuff and got him on a respirator and sit there and talk while he's breathing on that stinking thing like that. He can't hear nothing that's going on. Can you get a prayer through? Can you get a prayer through when your kids go prodigal? You're not fooling me. I've been around this stuff since nine months before I was born. I was raised in a Southern Baptist church since nine months before I was born. I was raised on drugs. I come from drug habitat. I was drugged to church in the morning, in the evening, and at supper time. Every time I turned around, they were dragging me to church. But I didn't get no choices in that. Oh, no, uh-uh. You going to church, boy. I don't want to go to church. Get out. Daddy, I'm six years old. Okay, then you're going to church. You know, it's like you don't get no choices in that. You get up on Saturday night and you polish your shoes. You lay out all your clothes, including your underclothing. You lay everything out and you jump up the next morning. You get ready. No excuses. You ain't going to be cowlick sticking up like that. He didn't care. It didn't make no difference. You're going to church. I'm glad that happened to me. But I've been around it for a long time. You're not fooling me. Our crowd, even though we got the Bible and even though we believe the truth, you know what? Our crowd ain't doing any better than the Catholics when it comes to raising our families. We have just as many divorces as they have. And we got the truth. We don't believe in praying to Mary. And if you're Catholic, I apologize to you, but you're an idiot if you believe praying to God's mother is going to make a difference to you. That's a foolishness. You say, why? The Bible says there's one mediator between God and man, the man Christ Jesus. And if that offends you, something's wrong with you. There's nothing wrong with me. I'm giving you the truth. I don't like how you said it. Okay, well, I'll, I'll change how I said it. You're a fool if you believe that Jesus' mama can get it. Pray to Jesus' mother and all that kind of... No, no, it ain't a matriarchal society. You don't pray. That ain't Mother's Day up there. No, Jesus' mother don't get his attention. He, she don't have a special sway with him. She's a sinner just like the rest of us is. You forget that's God manifesting the flesh. 
Now what I'm going to try to show you tonight here in sort of a short way and maybe in a little bit of a storybook fashion is to try to show you that it's time like those professional athletes said those two things. See, you thought I forgot where I was, but I don't. I've just ran a little rabbit trail for a little while. But now we done knocked that rabbit back in the head there and put him back in the bunny hole. Let me get back over here. Two things those professionals told me. Number one, they practiced the fundamentals. The second thing they said was is that we always start practice after practice. I said, what do you mean you start practice after practice? He said, we have to practice with the team and everything else. He said, but then after that, we practice what we're weak at. He said, the difference fundamentally, besides the fact that all of us professionals are gifted beyond our own ability, the difference in us and an amateur is one thing. We practice what we're bad at because we know that in the pressure of a game, our weaknesses will show up. I thought, man, that's profound. I'm going to write that down. <laughs> practice what you're weak at. He said most, most amateurs, they go out and they practice what they're good at because they're more worried about what people are seeing them do than what they're good at and what they're bad at. And he said, we practice what we're bad at. And I thought, man, there you go. Well, wouldn't that be something if we got back to thinking in our own personal life after practice is over, singing the hymns, reading their Bible, studying the Bible, pray, all those other kind of things. Where's your life at? Well, let me ask you this question. Let's, let's just do a little test real quick. How good are you at forgiveness? How good are you at not grieving the Holy Spirit? And grieve not the Holy Spirit of God, whereby you're sealed of the day or didn't. Let all wrath and mal uh, let all uh, bitterness be put away from you with all uh, 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 wrath and uh, all something put away with all malice. Grieve not the Holy Spirit of God and forgiving one another, even as God for Christ's sake hath forgiven you. How about being kind? Be ye kind one to another, tenderhearted. There's that thing again. Forgiving one another. <laughs> your professionals, are you? Well, that's where your relationship with the Lord starts. It starts with forgiveness. I don't know about you. That's a hard one. Somebody does you wrong in the South, buddy. I mean, we hitch up our galluses, you know, we spit off in the corner, you know, and, and yeah, we'd be a cold day down yonder in that place before we ever forgive you. Well, they've been dead for 40 years. Yep, yeah, well, you know, I wouldn't spit on our grave. Okay, good. You're not much like Jesus, are you? I didn't say witnessing. We could bring that up. I didn't say tithing. I said, well, you're a Baptist preacher. Don't you talk about money? Well, let me ask you a question. You think it's more important? He doesn't say anything about giving money in that passage when he says grieving the Holy Spirit. He's talking about wrath and anger and malice and bitterness being put away with you. And then he says, and forgiveness, and forgiveness, and forgiveness. How are you doing on that? Forget about whether or not, you know, well, I, I got plenty of money. I put plenty of money in the offering plate. That's an easy way out. Judas put a bunch of money in the offering plate. Just because you give money, I didn't ask you if you give money. That's a good practice. It's a great thing to do. Good. Praise the Lord. Give all the money. That's wonderful. But how are you doing with that bitterness? How are you doing with vengeance? How are you doing with slander and evil speaking and lying? How about gluttony? I'm not just talking about eating. I'm talking about being overindulged in a multitude of things. You got quiet on me all of a sudden. Y'all are doing pretty good. It's kind of like, well, now you done gone to meddling. <laughs> you done quit preaching, and we's enjoying it a little bit. You talk a little too fast for us up here, but, but, but now you done gone to meddling. We don't like that. You mean you don't like having pointed out what you're weak at, what you need to work on? I'm just here to say if, if it's a revival meeting, when I go to training camp with those guys, I sit and listen to the coaches. You know what he does? He points out the individuals and what they're weak at and embarrasses them in front of everybody and says, you need to work on it or you're off the team. Well, man, if we did that in our churches, we wouldn't be preaching to nobody, including the preacher. We'd be devoid of everybody. He said, what do you got? They're all out there working on stuff. They're off the team. You say, why? Because we don't work at what we're weak at, do we? It's hard for you, ain't it, to forgive? I bet some of you holding grudges. You've been holding grudges for 20 years, some of you. I was at a church one time up in Carolina. I was up there, and I was walking around in the cemetery up there praying and trying to figure out what I felt like the Lord wanted me to do. And I wasn't just putting on a show and acting spiritual. I was really struggling and that kind of a thing. Down in the south, back up in the mountains there, and mountain folks are a little different culturally and stuff, and I'm praying about it. And I'm thinking to myself along, the, along those lines, and a guy comes out there, and he says, What you doing out here? I said, oh, I'm just kind of looking around, man, just, you know, talking to the Lord a little bit and all that kind of stuff. He says, you know, my mama used to be laying right over our 
I said, well, no, I mean, what you mean? She is buried over there? She is buried over there, but they come in here and somebody said that she's on the property line, and so we had to dig her up, bless the Lord, and we had to move her over there, but that's Mama's spot. I thought she's dead. Now, I'm a little harsh maybe toward that kind of stuff. She ain't felt nothing. But boy, that son of her sure did. He said, you know, he says, I know you're here for this meeting and everything. He said, I'm going to come. I'll be in the back. But I wouldn't go to this church if my life depended on it. I said, why not? Because they made me move, Mama. <laughs> boy, 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 I must be on something there. They made me move, Mama. Okay, we'll see how you shake out of the judgment seat of Christ. Well, I guess we better get in the text. <laughs> that one sort of fell flat. Can I get a ride home with you tonight? <laughs> Look in your Bible at 1 Kings. Come over to 1 Kings chapter number. Well, we start in 17. We're going to be in 18. Let me just get you caught up to speed here. In 1 Kings chapter number 17, Elijah the Tishbite, he's from Tishbeer, he gets called out. We're talking about basics. We're talking about practicing. Can I say this to you? We're naturally by nature selfish and self-centered. Just own it, okay? We are. Skin for skin, all that a man hath, he gives for... I don't care if you, Grandma, and everybody thinks the world of you and all that. Somewhere behind all that is, is you're trying to get the attention because it's really all about you. Because let one of them young ones you stretching out for not be grateful for it and watch how quick you cut them off. I'll cut you right out of my wheel. Don't come by and see me. I'll rat you right out of that thing, you ungrateful little pinhead you. I know, I've been it. I'm from the South, buddy. I mean, they'll cut you out because you don't show up at Christmas or you don't show up at Easter or you don't show up. God help you if you don't show up at Mother's Day. Mother's Day, that's the Holy Grail. Must be the Holy Grail up here too. <laughs> Why you got to have it on Sunday? Anyway, I think they ought to make as big a deal out of Father's Day as they do Mother's Day. Now, I'm grateful for my mama. I got a good mama. I got a real good mama. She's still kicking. She's 93 years old and still teaching a Sunday school class. And she's all twisted up like a pretzel and got arthritis and all that other kind of stuff. Daddy's been gone now for about 25 years. She's been living by herself. And she's still in her right mind for the most part and doing real good. I had a good mama. I'm not making fun of that. But I'm saying that come to the Lord or my mama, my mama would, would literally tell me I'm wrong if I put my mama over the Lord. But some people, they just kind of like to do that. They don't mind kicking the Lord off the throne. It kind of reminds me of that fellow. I think there's a fellow in Isaiah 14, if I remember right. That fellow said something like, I'll put my throne above the stars of heaven. I'll be like the most high. I will set my... Something like that, right? Okay, so here's the thing. In 1 Kings 17, you see that. That's the passage there where Tishbite gets called out. He goes over three and a half years there. He sits by the great, uh, the river there, chair the brook chair. The Lord feeds him with uh, ravens and, I don't know, uh, McDonald's or Hardee's or something with them birds pick up for him, drop for him every day. Ravens or scavenger birds. I can't imagine what they dropped him. And he had water. Then he goes over and he meets the woman there of Zerapath, and she's got a, a biscuit for him. And he's a good, well-known Baptist preacher, so he takes her last biscuit. Just like a preacher to do that. You know how them money-grubbing preachers are. They always, you know, take whatever got as long as he's taken care of. And test the woman's faith, and then everything works out there. And then the kid dies, and Elijah raises him back up. And the Lord said, I want you to go over there and talk to Ahab. This is where I want to be. Now look in that passage right there, and notice, if you will, please, there in 1 Kings chapter number uh, 18. And you come all the way down here just so that we get to the point. Look in verse number 17. The Bible says, The Lingam to pass, and Ahab saw Elijah, and Ahab said unto him, Art thou to him that troubleth Israel? Ain't it interesting when you're the one that's the problem, it's always somebody else's fault. One of the surest ways that you can know that there's something wrong between you and the Lord is you're always finding fault with everybody else. Life is too busy for you to be consumed with what everybody else is doing or not doing. Let them do their own thing. God will sort it out in the end. The old military guys used to say, you know, um, um, they used to say something's kind of harsh. They'd say, kill them all and let God sort them out. Well, in this sense of the word, there's some things you get so troubled about that you just consumes you. It just wraps you up. And nowadays, you don't use the telephone and speak with your mouth. Nowadays, you use your fingers. Nowadays, it's email and Instagram and Snapchat and 
Twitter and it's uh, Facebook and all the other kind of stuff, and I won't make all the jokes about that kind of stuff, but you become consumed with slander and you become consumed with rumors and you become consumed with being a busybody and house to house, only nowadays that stuff creeps in and comes in through cables and comes across the air and comes in through the Wi-Fi, and the next thing you know, you know what happens? The problem's you, 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 the problem's the president, the problem's the government, the problem is the school teacher, the problem the policeman, the problem is the preacher, the problem is the trustee, the problem is the treasurer, the problem is the piano player, the problem is the soloist, the problem is my wife, the problem is my husband, the problem is my kids, the problem is the, never you, is it? You ain't never the problem. You say, how do you know that? Oh, well, you know, well, because you're always pointing everybody else's problem out. Well, how about standing in the mirror and say, I know where the problem is. And just take a long look right there and just say, I know the problem. I can tell you the problem. I'm not trying to be hard on you. Please don't hate me yet. <laughs> I'm not done yet. At least let me get finished. And then if you want to hate me, that's fine. I got a nice ending. If you just let me be there, <laughs> just, just take me a minute to get there. But do but you ever recognize that about yourself? You ever recognize that when you get out of fellowship with the Lord, how interesting it is, to, how quickly you forget how good He was and merciful to forgive you? Amen. When was the last time you had a good old 1 John 1, 9 meeting with the Lord? I'm talking about just you and him, just what you and him know about. And you get down there between the tongue and groove and you say, Lord, be merciful to me, a sinner, and I know I'm saved and going to heaven and glory bound and praise the Lord for it. But Lord, I am a miserable, rotten, cantankerous, good for nothing and lay out what you are. When's the last time you had one of those? Isn't our prayers sometimes go after the give me? Isn't it go from give me to get him? Isn't it go from give me to get her? Now, Lord, in my life, it would be a lot better if you get rid of her. Hey, listen, you married her. He ain't going to get rid of her. <laughs> you just have to learn to live with it. And, sister, I'm sorry. You, must have have, I, you have a great case for temporary insanity. My wife certainly does. After 40-something years now, she'd look back there and say, I must have been insane. There's no question about that. But she stuck with me now. But let me ask you a question. You know what he says right there to that, to that king? He says, you're the one that's causing the trouble. No, the trouble is because Israel has having now a famine and there's no water in the land. There's been no rain in the land. You say, why? Because Israel sinned against God. The problem is not the preacher. The problem is the king. Isn't that funny? Isn't that how we are? I mean, you're going to find yourself in the story somewhere. Why don't we take on the position of Ahab? Oh, I'm not Ahab. Some of you sure as the world are. You're married to Jezebel. Some of you guys wanted so bad to laugh right then, but you're like, oh, hmm. that was a setup. Yeah, maybe a little bit. But you wanted to laugh. You can chuckle later. You were laughing under your. I saw that grin almost come up, you know, but you felt that elbow and signed. Yeah, you better not, honey. I, I understand. I know how it is. But you know what happens here is, is come on down here and let me just show you a couple of steps before I get to the main point of the, of the message here. We've only been going about six or seven minutes here on the last point. <laughs> Notice what he says there to him. He says, I want to meet you up here at the OK Corral up on top of the mountain. And notice what he says in verse number 18. He answered, I have not troubled Israel, but thou and thy father's house, and have forsaken the commandments of the Lord, and have followed Balaam. And then he says, send, and let's go up here to Car Carmel. Here's step number one. Look at the end of verse number 19. This is expositorily. Look at verse number 19. The prophets of the groves 400, which eat at whose table? Can I ask you a question? Would you be willing to leave some things, get up from some things if they're hindering you from getting to the Lord? You know, one of the hardest things to do during a revival is to get people to leave their comfort zone. One of the hardest things in the world is to get a Christian to step out by faith like he did when he got saved and say, you know something, there's some tables I need to get up from. I need to get away from some things that I'm doing and from some people I'm hanging out with and from some habits that I have. I know how habits are. Habits are like easy chairs. They're easy to get into, but boy, they're hard to get out of. Habits. Sometimes those habits are, you think, well, there's good habits. There are, but you ain't the good habits that create problems for us, is it? Ain't it the bad ones? Would you be willing to get up from the table tonight if it were to get you close to the Lord? Well, now, preacher, you know I have to study that thing a while. Go ahead and study it on out and see if I don't tell you what's right to do. You know what the Lord said? Come unto me, all you that labor and are heavy laden, and I'll give you a rest. 
There's an effort that's required. You've got to go against, rab, uh, against gravity. When he tells Moses to come over there in Deuteronomy chapter 32, when he tells Moses, he says, come on up to the mountaintop. You say, what do you mean? He's got to come against gravity. It requires effort to be in fellowship with the Lord. I wish it wasn't so. I wish you could just sit there. Listen, salvation he did, there's nothing to it. It's instantaneous and he takes care of it immediately. But boy, having the Christian life and having fellowship with Jesus Christ and walking with him and talking with him, man, there is is pressing toward the mark there is pushing toward the calling and the high calling of God there is always pressure trying to keep you from doing right you know what the easy thing to do is just sit and soak right where you are just sit and soak really just sit there you know I'm, I'm fine I like just I like where I'm at I just like it I just I just like it you know what the first step you have to be willing to do the first step you have to be willing to do is is you have to be willing to get up from Jezebel's table and say, you know what I'm in the wrong company I'm at the wrong place for the wrong time with the wrong people I got no business being here I need to go to the house the second thing you'll see if you come down through that passage is he says you have to get ready to do some research which we're doing now I got to do some checking I got to find out you know how do you get that preacher it's right in the passage how long halts you between two opinions I'll tell you why you won't get up you're sitting there trying to decide should I shouldn't I should I shouldn't I man you were hoping when you got out on one knee and said baby will you marry me you were hoping she didn't say well I don't know maybe I should 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 you were like baby make up your mind you're living in a day and time what's called Laodicea. That's called fence riders. That's called people that can't make a cotton-picking decision. They just sit around all the time and say, well, I don't know. I just look at it a while. Just I ain't sure. Just You can't get them to make a decision about nothing. You get behind them in a, one of them buffet things. If you happen to go to them things, Paul did buffet himself. You get in one of them buffet things, and they sit there and they're looking. It's funny. I, you'll get a, a lady that'll go ahead of you, and, and she'll just, you know, she'll just, oh, well, maybe just a tad, you know, and, and then just a little bit, and then just a little bit, and then just a little bit. Here comes the guy behind there. He's like, you know, and he, he's got about three things on the plate, and she's got a plate that's twice as full as his, but it's just a little bit of everything because she's on a diet, you know. She just, I'm just going to have a taste. You know, I just a little taste of this and just a little taste of that, just a little taste of the strawberry shortcake, just a little taste of that Sunday, just a little taste of that nanner split, just a little taste of that peach cobbler, just a little taste, of, just, just a little taste. And then she gets done about things like that, and she looks like she needs to see Omar the tent maker to be able to get her dress made. <laughs> but you know what he said? How long halt you between? How, how long before you decide to make a decision? You've got to make a decision to do what God wants you to do. That's what revival's about. I'm not trying to be hard on you, but some of you, I don't think a stick of dynamite would move you. You're just like, I shall not be, I shall not be moved. I shall not be, I shall not be moved. I'm like a tree planted by the water. Okay, well, then just stay there and rot. That's all I know to tell you. You, you got spiritually constipated. That's what you're, 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 you look like that this, this evening. You're just kind of, you kind of stove up. You know, it's kind of, you, you know what constipation is, don't you? Y'all don't have a, y'all don't have that problem. Well, why do you get old? You'll have that problem. You don't eat enough fiber. Get you some more vegetables and get you some rabbit food and stuff. But spiritually, you're all clogged up. You need a good cleaning out. You need a good movement. You need to do something. How long halts you between two opinions? Well, you come down on that passage there and you come over there in an old Schofield to be over on the right-hand page. You come down that left-hand column and uh, Baal worshipers are over there jumping in the plates and they're cutting themselves and they're doing all kind of crazy shenanigans. Look like a charismatic contemporary service nowadays. They got services back home. I don't know if you have them up here. You probably do. But back home they got these churches where they got these dancers and stuff running around in leotards with these ribbon things and stuff like that. Boy, I'm going to tell you what, they have filled up a church with a bunch of men like they're going to some kind of a nightclub at nighttime. And they're out there doing this in the name of the Lord, running around in leotards. And I'm positive that all them men that are sitting there are having the purest thoughts about God they possibly could. Their wives are constantly over there putting their hands over their eyes and their wives are pumping them and thumping them and all that. How you could call that stuff godly is beyond me. In church, I, I, can't, even, I, don't even, I can't even understand that stuff. But at any rate, I guess I'm just old school when it comes to that. You know what happened? They're over there doing the hoochie coo and they're dancing around. They're acting the fool and they're playing their rock and roll music and they're thumping it out and bumping it out and, you know, looking like the rest of the world and no rain. Why, if anybody should have been able to be in rain, it should have been Baal. He's the god of thunder. 
He's the one that's supposed to be the God of fertility. He's supposed to be the one that brings the, the crops, uh, the, 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 the success of the crops. He's supposed to be the one that causes the animals to, to have babies. I mean, he ought to be. That's in his wheelhouse. Where's the rain, Baal? There ain't no rain. There ain't no rain. There ain't no rain. There ain't no rain. Finally, 12 o'clock comes and all the Baptists leave. You'll get that in a minute. And that's when they close, when the sun's at high noon, because they're sun worshipers. So your preacher goes past 12 o'clock and get the Baptist salute. <laughs> See, what happened to your watch? I took it off. You say, why? Well, so I can keep up with time. Doesn't mean I'm going to pay attention to it, but it means I can keep up with it. <laughs> I'm glad you're laughing. They ain't laughing. <laughs> And they're back there going, stop laughing. He thinks he's funny. <laughs> My wife says it's pity laugh. It's not real funny. <laughs> you know what you see? It's his time to come there. You know what he says? Here's the old preacher. He gets down there and he looks around. He says, okay, man, I'm time to make an, an offering. Now, you want to catch this. We're back in the days of Abel now. Think long and hard about it. You say, what does he do? He gets ready to make a sacrifice. Isn't that interesting? Israel's been out of fellowship with God for three and a half years. Longer than that, if you count all the time of wickedness. For three and a half years, they've been under a famine. That's God's judgment on the nation of Israel. Guess what the first thing that he does to get them back is? He builds an altar. Guess what the last thing we do is? Build an altar. Guess what the last thing we do as Baptists, Southern, Independent, General, Regular, whatever you want to be, as Christians, guess what the last thing is that we do? Build an altar. You say, why? We don't like that humbling. We don't like that sacrificing. Boy, you know what we'll do? We'll pump money into a building. We'll pump money into some new music program. We'll pump money into the youth program. We'll have us a, a big youth camp or we'll do something. We won't stop long enough to build an altar. Guess what happened to the altar? The altar was in disrepair. You know why it was in disrepair? Ain't nobody used it in three and a half years. Wonder why there's a famine. Wonder why we're spiritually dry today. Could it be just possibly that our altars are in need of repair? Is it just possible that maybe we need to have a good old-fashioned meeting with the Lord? And so guess what happens? He said, hey, I can't offer anything on here. The altar is broken down. It's torn up. And so he begins to gather the stones. And he has to first of all repair the altar. Hey, listen, after you get up from Jezebel's table and after you make the decision, guess what you're going to have to decide? I need to get back to an old-fashioned altar. I'm not talking about getting resaved. I already told you about eternal security. I'm saved whether I go to the altar ever again or not. And some of you, you ain't going to go to the altar. You say, why? You're too proud. The devil ain't going to never go to the altar. You can forget about that. That ship has sailed, man. That chapter is written in indelible ink. He ain't going to come. I can tell you this. Some of you, you wouldn't, you wouldn't dare think about it. And the day's going to come. And somebody's going to need you to get a prayer through. And you're going to make a hospital bed your altar you're going to make a chair beside somebody dying in the hospital your altar you're going to come back to the altar sooner or later and you're going to say God I need some help and the Lord's like you should have repaired this thing a long time ago we could have got some business done but now you got to work on repairing the altar before you can get anything through See, what are you talking about? You said you wanted a revival. You said preach about revival. That's where it starts. Back to basics. Back to fundamentals. Preacher, that's just old school. That's stuff they did in the 50s. Yeah, and it worked. Our problem is we don't want to use what works. we got to come up with something newfangled. Why? If it ain't broke, don't fix it. It worked. What? I'm telling you older folks, what you did in the day worked. Pass it on to these young'uns. Grab them by the arm, grab them by the nap of the neck, get them by the cotton-picking ear and say, you going to altar and praying with me. You teach them how to play baseball, football, basketball, golf, video games, Facebook, Instagram, Snapchat, email, electronics, all kind of stuff academically. When's the last time you taught them how to pray? Last time you taught them how to humble themselves at the altar of God? Last time you told them that God can do something for them? When's the last time you passed that heritage on? Instead of, well, you know, they're real successful now. They got six figures in the bank and they all set for life, got plenty of insurance and live in a big old house on a hill, got them 100 acres out there, got some cows and some corn and everything. Oh, they doing good and couldn't get a hold of God for nothing. They're so far away from God they couldn't hit him with a 7 millimeter magnum. You say, why? Us old people drop the ball. 
we were afraid to take a young man and say, hey, I'll go pray with you. You want to pray? I was raised in a time where the old men would come up and say, hey, boy, come on, I'll pray with you. Well, I don't see that anymore. You say, well, that's invasive. Invasive. That stuff makes me gag. It makes me so, uh, so upset at gag a maggot. I get so upset about that. You say, why? You don't mind flipping on that television and letting them watch all them filthy words and watch all them filthy shows. You don't mind training them in that. You don't mind letting them sit down and play with them cotton-picking electronic games and sit around and play with a telephone. We were going through the security there the other day, and this kid comes up there. He's about four, and he's got a phone. And they take him up out of his little stroller thing, and they're trying to get him to go through security, and he won't give up his phone. Well, I had the TSA thing, so I went through the whole deal, and I just I had time, so I just backed off and watched for a little while. And I watched them argue with that kid and argue with that kid and argue with that kid and fuss with that kid. And then I watched this heavyset black woman. She got down there, and she said, Now, listen here, young man. We're going to have to eat. He said, No. And I'm thinking, Oh, come to Jesus, baby. I'm telling you. I'm waiting for Mama to, like, you know. I mean, you know, she's like, now, honey, you have to do what the nice policeman says, the nice officer. They're just here to help us and all this and that and the other. And I thought, and now it's starting to back up and the flights are starting to get called and the people in that line are starting to get a little bit on the agitated side. And I'm enjoying the side show. If I'd have had some popcorn, I'd have ate it. I'm just sitting over there like this watching. And I'm thinking, boy, this is going to really be something. And then all of a sudden, here comes this Mexican guy. And I'm telling you before the Lord, you can check me when we get there. His name was Jesus. His name said Jesus. I said, oh, here comes Jesus, right? His name was Jesus. And he walks up to that kid and he said, give me your phone right there. And he goes, no. He snaps that thing from you. And I'm thinking, put him on the conveyor belt and run him through with it. <laughs> he snatched that phone away from him and threw it in the bucket. And he goes, now get through there. And the kid's like, you know, <laughs> and comes out the other side and he grabs the phone and he goes to hand him the kid and goes, I thought, you know what, that's a great illustration. Moses learned that he couldn't approach the burning bush as long as he had on shoes of Egypt. You know what, some of you, you won't come to the altar. You say, why? You ain't going to leave Egypt's shoes off. You ain't going to let him take your phone away from you. You say, why? Because once the altar gets built, guess what has to go on it? A sacrifice. It ain't a barbecue grill. It's going to cost you something. David goes to the threshing floor of Ornan up there and, and Ornan says to him, Hey, listen, king, I understand what's happened and all these men have died, 70,000 because of your pride and that kind of a deal. And I know you're going up there to offer it. He said, You can take everything. You know what David said? Profound. I'll not bring anything. The Lord don't cost me something. You know what the problem is? They get ready to put that altar. You say, What goes on that altar, preacher? Well, surely you know. You say, Well, it was a bullock and it was laid up there and it was cut into pieces. That's true, 100%. You're right. That's what was on the altar. How come he asked for 12 barrels of water? And then another one to fill up the trench. Well, preachers, now see, I, I, I've been to a little Bible school. I can tell you, see, that's a, that's a barrel of water for every one of them tribes. And, and then that filling up that trench right there, that's for all the ones that are sojourners with the nation of Israel that come out. And so the Lord's got the water. Really? Well, could it maybe be this? Is it possible that the most precious substance that there was in existence in that day was water? Is it possible that what the Lord was looking for if they wanted to bring rain was for them to give up what they were dependent on? You ever pause to wonder all the way back to the law of first minutes and you ever, ever pause to wonder about that story about Cain and Abel? There's a lot in that story. You say, what happened? That's a story about two brothers. Cain comes over there. He's a farmer. And you folks know about farming here. You good Lord have mercy. You ought to know about farming. Your soil is just as black as asphalt up here. You can probably grow anything up here, I would imagine. But you've got all that kind of stuff, and it drains real good up here, I reckon. It sure looks like it anyway. But anyhow, I don't know nothing about farming. But, but, it, but anyway, you know what he does? He brings all the fruits and vegetables that the Lord provided for him. He puts them on the altar. And the Lord don't do nothing. He just sits there. He's at church. He's worshiping. He's religious. He brought his offering. And then all of a sudden Abel comes up there and Abel comes along there and he brings a firstling of his flock, a little bit of lamb, you know, a little fuzzy, a little nose and that kind of stuff and been chasing the butterflies out there along the clover patch and that kind of a thing and brings that little thing and that little thing's cuddling up next to him and then he lays him over there on the altar and takes that knife out and slits that throat, boy, and that blood splatters all over the place. That little old lamb never even bleated, never opened its mouth. 
and he backs off there with his head bowed and his hands turned up and he said Lord I sure hope you'll accept my sacrifice and I sure do love you and I sure appreciate everything you've done for me and he backs off and boy out of a Carolina blue sky a bolt of lightning comes and picks up that little old lamb boy and burns it and the Lord said I'll accept it but look at the other side of the picture there there's a boy over there his face is so long you could ice cream out of a butter churn he just looks at him look at him look at look at him see him he's mad he's sad he, uh, he's poochy lipped he's gonna go to his man cave he's he's mad he's gonna pout that's what men do ain't that right ladies big old bull of a man Billy goes gruff boy and you get him you know he pouts like a little boy you know He's over there pouting. The Lord said, hey, Cain, why is your countenance falling? He said, well, I mean, I brought you what I had. Uh, I'm a farmer. I bought you the best I have. You took my brothers. You didn't take me. He said, well, I got an answer for you. Okay, well, what's the answer? Why don't you take my vegetables? He said, no, here's the answer. Don't you know if you bring what I want you to bring, I'll accept your offering too? Wouldn't that be a blessing to you, Cain? He said, well, yeah. What do you want me to bring? Well, I want a lamb. Uh, 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 there ain't but one shepherd in town. The Lord said, yeah, I know. Yeah, he's my brother. Yeah. You think I'm going to go to my brother? Well, you want to be right with me? Then get right with your brother. Wherever two or three are gathered together in my name, there am I in the midst. I ain't talking about a church service. You better go get the context of Matthew 18. The context of Matthew 18 is when you and a brother have ought against one another and you make things right, the Lord blesses the union because you got it right with your brother. You ain't quite ready to have a worship service yet, are you? You mean I got to go to my brother and then get a lamb from him in order to be right with you? Yeah, but be careful now before you make that decision. Sin lies at the door. He said, if I got to go make things right with him in order to be right with you, nothing doing. The Lord said, okay, fugitive and a vagabond thou shalt be. Get out. You say, well, but Abel got killed. Yeah, but boy, what a way to go. He went out worshiping God. So what happened to Cain? He's in hell. You know what's going to happen? It's going to boil down to that. By the time these next three nights are over with, you know what's going to boil down to? Are you willing to bring and put on the altar what God wants you to bring? I didn't say what you're willing to bring. I said what God wants you to bring. Would you be willing to go to your brother or sister and make things right? If that's what it took to get God to answer your prayer. Well, preacher, that's a mighty high price. I said, it's precious. I said, it cost you something. Some of you folks in here, I guarantee you, you could bring and put 10 grand on the altar. It wouldn't, wouldn't be nothing. It'd be like me putting $100 up there. 10 grand, there it is. Lord said, that ain't what I want. I tell you what I would. What do you want, Lord? Whatever you want, you got a blank check. You just ask me for it, I'll give it to you. What do you want? I'll take your bitterness. I'll take your anger, your wrath. I'll take your unforgiving spirit. No, Lord, I ain't going to do that. You want to get right with me? Yeah, go, go fix it with your brother or sister. Go fix it with the preacher. Go fix it with whoever it is. I ain't doing it. Well, you know how the story ends. The story ends when he goes up there and the Lord winds up striking that thing, burns up all that water and all the rocks and all the stones and all that other kind of stuff and then he goes up there on the mountain apart to pray, and then he gets ready to start praying. And uh, he says to the boy, he says, you see anything yet? No, sir, I ain't seen nothing yet. He says, well, look again. He goes, he said, well, now I see there's a, there is a cloud up there about the size of a man hand. And over lies his grins. And he says, boy, go tell the king's fix and come a frog strangler, man. You better, better hightail it for the country. Frog strangler, that's a southern for a big flood, heavy rain. Frog strangler. You can use that if you want to. And he said, you better get ready to pray. And you say, what happened? Well, the message of the story is, is back to the beginnings before the rain falls and the nation is replenished and begins to flourish. There's a requirement of a sacrifice. Step number one is worship. It's not walk or work. It's being willing to get back to basics, to get up from the table and decide, okay, Lord, I'm going to do what you want me to do, or I'm going to do what I want to do. That's the decision right now. The decision, ladies and gentlemen, right now for you at this moment is not some big universal decision. You know what it boils down to? Your will or his will. It's called the Gethsemane experience. 
the Lord's up there and he says, is there any way this uh, uh, cup can pass from me? You know what the father said to him? No. So how do you know? The Lord said, nevertheless, not, say it with me, not, but, there you go, worship first. You see what happened? He wound up going to the altar. That's where your relationship started with him. It started at Calvary. If you're saved, it started at Calvary. It started in a baptismal pool. All that did was get you wet. You can tell you get baptized every day. If you take a shower every day, you can be a Methodist and get sprinkled. Just get in the shower. You know, oh, I got sprinkled today. I must be saved and all that kind of No, you ain't. You ain't saved by water. You're not saved by getting dunked. You know how your relationship started? It started with somebody being stretched out on an altar and being willing to forgive you of all your miserable, rotten sins, past, present, and future, and wash you in the blood of Jesus Christ. Well, sure as I'm standing here, it started with worship, with Him making the sacrifice. Now, here comes the deal. You want to worship Him now? Okay, your turn to put up. Could you pray a prayer tonight and say, Lord, if you want me to go to the mission field, you want me to go to Bible school, you want me to be a better husband, you want me to be a better wife, you want me to be more forgiven, you want me to get control of at least 20 of my foot of my 40 foot tongue, you want me to learn to get things in control, Lord, uh, what do you want? Could you write the Lord a blank check? Bow down at the altar and get down there right at your seat maybe and get down there at the altar and write out a check and say, okay, Lord, you put in what you want. Could you do that? What's the matter? You don't trust him? You think it's better in your hands than his? You think he would ask you for 12 barrels of water and one to fill up the trench if he didn't plan on it raining for you? But you see, the problem is, is that we're looking for the fire. No, they needed the rain. They didn't need the fire. We want the fire to fall. No, you don't. You need to be replenished. Right now, with the stuff you've been through in the last couple of years, if you've been breathing on planet Earth, you've been so much fear and anxiety, you've been through so much trouble and difficulty and so much uncertainty and so many different people talking in different ways from all over the stuff, you're 24 hours a day, seven days a week, have that stuff pumped through your system, you can't help but be dried out. Some of you look like that old sponge laying up there on the sink. You know how it is, it lays up there for a while and it gets dry and it gets crusty and you pick it up and it's like, my goodness, man, you soak it down, put it in the bowl, throw it in the microwave and nuke it a little bit, you know, for a while and then try to cool it off so you can, some of you like that crusty sponge, aren't you? You're kind of thirsty, aren't you? Kind of dried out, ain't you? You say what? Life's drying you out. I'm, I'm for you. I'm agreeing with you. It dries you out. Man, good night alive, you get wrung out like a sponge. Every time you turn on the television, there's some more crisis. Somebody done shot somebody, somebody done killed somebody, somebody's going to blow somebody up, somebody this, somebody that, and now you go by. I mean, man, you get anxiety going by looking at the stinking gas prices. They ought to put them on the stinking uh, thing where it just flips over all the time. It just keeps going and going and going and going, 485 495 It's going to be $10 a gallon for long. Might be. I got no idea. You say, what does it do? It dries you out. So what do you need? You need the rain. But the rain don't come before sacrifice is made. All that in the last 15 or 20 minutes that I've been here with you, all that to tell you this. You want to have revival? It starts where it started to begin with. It's back to basics. It's time for a come to Jesus meeting. It's time to bow our heads and to get down on our knees and humble ourselves under the mighty hand of God and say, God, I don't know about the nation, and I don't know about the world, and I don't know about the atheists and the communists, and I don't know about them, and I don't know about that. Lord, it's me, it's me, it's me, oh Lord, standing in the need of prayer. I need you, me. It's time you get back to that. And if you don't want to, great, I'll see you next night or two, or not. Maybe you say, I got got three nights worth in one night. Okay, I understand. I don't blame you. Really, I don't blame you. I understand. If you don't want to be, that ain't, I understand. I ain't going to be mad at you. And I ain't going to preach at you because you ain't here. You're not going to do, I preach at whoever's here. I'm not preaching at Mr. Empty Pew. I don't care about Mr. Empty Pew. I don't know why he ain't here. You're here. I might kick off tonight and be like, well, good. The world will be a better place without it. Yeah, but boy, I'll be in a great place. Now I'm going to ask you a question before I turn it over to your pastor. I want you to think about it for a minute. How long halt you between two opinions? How long? Are you going to serve the world or are you going to serve the Lord? Are you going to serve yourself or are you going to serve Him? 
How long before you say, you know something, Lord, I just need to get back to where I started. You know what I need to do? I need to go back and remember what you did for me at Calvary, and I need to come up there, and I realize I don't need to be resaved, Lord. I understand that. But, Lord, I've lost that pioneering, sacrificial spirit, Lord, where I used to go to charge hell with a squirt gun full of gasoline. And I've gotten a little comfortable, Lord, and it ain't cost me nothing lately to follow you. See, we've become a society of Christians that expect to be given everything. We've stopped giving. You older folks, with the greatest of respect, you're where you are because you are a giving society. I don't give a two cents for anybody that talks about the World War II generation. You'd be speaking Japanese or German if it wasn't for you. I don't care what anybody says making fun of it. They're younger than you, and they didn't live through what you lived through, and they didn't come through a depression, and they're just a bunch of stinking nincompoops as far as I'm concerned. Well, that's a proud generation. Well, you better thank God for them, buddy, or you'd be going, <laughs> or you'd be sprechen sie Deutsch. Nein, nur ein bisschen. No, we speak English. You say, why? Because some people are willing to pay a price. Uh, but been a while you kind of was leaning on that pretty heavy aren't you on what you used to be and what you used to do and how it used to be ain't it time you know who's in that crowd there's kids in that crowd there's young adults in that crowd you know there's married couples in that crowd you know who's in that crowd from Israel there's old people in that crowd that sacrifices for everybody it's for every one of us young and old, preachers and non-preachers. That's where it began. And that's where we need to get back to before we can move forward. Heavenly Father, I pray that you might help us this week, these few days we have together, to maybe spend some time repairing our altars and then use them for what you want to use them for to restore our relationship with you. I pray, Lord, you'll bless this meeting, bless these folks that have come, some from a long distance, to be here. I pray you'll give them something, Lord, that'll help them this week. We pray in the name of Jesus Christ. Amen. Stay with your head bowed, your eyes closed. Spend a little bit of time here this evening. As Miss Erica begins to play. The altar's open. Seat's open. Aisleways open.